can you please tell us just what the fine-tuning argument and problem has been in physics? Right, so fine-tuning, you know, imagine the old radios, right, that you had to kind of tune into the station, and if you didn't quite get it right, you wouldn't hear the music, right? So the fine-tuning is somewhat like that. Imagine that uh, the way we understand nature is through this alphabet, the alphabet of constants, you know, the constants that the physicists like to call the constants of nature. So you have the electron mass, you have the electron charge, the proton mass, the proton charge, there's quite a few of those, right? And the point is this, is that those constants have been measured through the ages to have certain values which are very specific. And had they been otherwise, meaning if those values were different, nature would have worked in a very different way than it does. And if nature worked in a very different way than it does, we wouldn't be here. So the fine-tuning essentially means the constants of nature, they have the value that they do have, and because of that, we are possible. So the question becomes, why those values? Right. If you were different, we wouldn't be here. So why, why would we not be here? Because be no life? if you tweak just a little bit the proton mass, stars would not be possible. If you tweak the proton mass, if you tweak the neutron mass, just a tiny bit, less than a percent, stars would behave differently, they would burn much faster, they would not produce the heavier elements like calcium, iron, that we need. Hmm. So, so, so if the stars were, if the, so what would happen if the stars were different? Without fine tuning, the stars would not behave the way they do, they would not produce the chemical elements that they do, and life as we know it, which depends on a whole set of different chemical elements, would not be possible. So when people jokingly say we're all stardust, it's not a joke. I mean, it's actually beautiful, it's true. We definitely are stardust. Mm -hmm. And in fact, all the chemical elements that we have in our bodies, you know, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your, in your blood, they belong to stars billions of years ago, before the solar system existed. So what have been the, 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 sort of the, the responses to that problem then, over the last 30 years? Right, so one of the responses is, who cares? You know, it just happened to be that way. It's, a, it's an accident, and the fact that it's an accident doesn't make it special at all, right? Um, so that's one possibility, it's all random, right? And, and because of that, there's no reason to try to explain it, which is quite appealing, actually, in many <laughs> ways. Uh, the other one is to say, there is a reason for this. Everything has a reason. And the goal of science is to explain why things are the way they are. Hence, the fact that the electron has this mass and et cetera, et cetera, must have a causal reason, uh, explanation, right? And so what would that be? So then it becomes not so much a fine-tuning, but a search for an explanation for the fine-tuning, right. right? There have been a few out there, but the most popular one nowadays comes from something called string theory, which is a very uh, bold attempt to understand nature in a completely different way than we usually understand, which is that instead of things being made of little bits called elementary particles, they are actually made of vibrating wiggly things called strings. And the same way that, you know, when you play a violin or a guitar, you, you, you pluck a string and if you change where your finger is, you're gonna get a different sound, a different frequency of vibration. Those strings can vibrate in different ways. And depending how they vibrate, they actually emulate the properties of all the different particles of nature. So it's a very cool idea, you know, and it's an idea that in principle, in principle, could bring together all different forces of nature. So the big grand unified theory. Problem is, on these string theories, is that uh, you would hope originally when they were proposed in the uh, early 80s, they're called super strings, they would say, we're going to solve these equations and the solution is going to be the universe. <laughs> as we know it, you know, everything is in there. And, you know, people tried and tried and tried. Did you, did you try? I tried, yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the problems with these theories is that you have 10 dimensions, you know, nine spatial in one time. <laughs> and then you say, you look around, you're like, wait a second, I only see three, you know, <laughs> is it north, south, east, west, up, down, right, three? Where are the other six? The other dimensions I hear, they're just curled up really small and we can't see them? That's right. They're really so small that you cannot see so them. So they're all around us? They're all around each point of space. Imagine this. 
imagine each point of space has a little six-dimensional blob or sphere <laughs> associated with it, right? And, uh, and that's what it is. And, you know, it's not so crazy because, you know, if you look at, if you look at this, okay, this is a stick, okay? If you, if you look at it from very, very far away, it's going to look like a line. And a line is the one-dimensional thing, right? You can only go this way or that way. But you look closer and you realize it's not really a line because you can also go around. Yeah. So this is more like a cylinder. But from far away, it looks like it has one dimension because this circular dimension around it is too tiny compared to the length of the stick. The idea is exactly the same. Every point in space has this six-dimensional sphere hidden in it, right? And it's just so tiny we don't see it. And so the question is, why are they so tiny? So back to strings. Okay, so strings to exist have to vibrate in this nine-dimensional space. <laughs> and the point is, those extra six dimensions, they can be folded up in many different ways. Just like, you know, if you get like a balloon, you can twist it, you can make holes in it. These are different topologies, yeah. okay? So the six-dimensional extra space has different topologies. When people start to calculate how many of these could be around instead of the universe coming out, they came up with a ridiculously huge number, which is a 10 with 500 zeros on top, so one with 500 zeros afterwards. Isn't that many more particles than we have in the universe? Oh, oh we have yeah, many, 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 many but more that's particles. That's a big number, though. It is a ridiculous number, <laughs> which means now what? Right? So the goal, the dream of finding the universe became what do we do with all this stuff? That's where the multiverse came up. So each solution, each folding of this extra dimensional space is potentially a different kind of universe. So we've got to have 10 to the power 500 different universes yes. to explain this one. Exactly. But instead of having the difficulty of explaining how one universe comes into being, now we've got to explain how 10 to the 500 universes came right. in. And since we can't explain this one, it seems to me we've just made the from all. A whole lot worse, yeah, not yeah, better. But, but I think exactly. the argument would be that you, but now you've got a mathematical theory at least, a beautiful yeah. theory which explains. That, I don't know. It seems so beautiful to me. We used to have a one know, universe we need to explain. Now we've got loads. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like uh, the universe now becomes a data point in a vast manifold of, of possible points, right? And yeah. and you're sort of like, are you really explaining something with that? Did you gain any knowledge from that? And there's a question maybe about, can you do experiments on? That to me is the fundamental question, right? Which is physics is supposed to be an empirically validated science. You come up with some hypothesis, doesn't matter how crazy it is, but it has to be empirically tested. You've got to make an experiment on observation, say, yeah, it's okay, or it's not okay. In practice, it's not so, black and white yeah. okay there are many many subtleties to this argument but at the end of the day you need to be able to prove your idea otherwise it's not physics you prove it's it something by, else. by experiments you prove it by experiments and that's why there is the rift yeah. right because it's something else because it's a different way of doing science yeah. because what you're trying to do now is you're bringing up an idea that is based on an a posteriori reasoning which is we're here we start from that, right? And usually the explanation is, how did we get here? Yeah. I mean, you go from beginning to end. Now you're starting from the end, and you want to create an argument based on our existence, you know? And, and the point is, is that good enough as an explanatory tool, or are we just throwing in the towel and pretending we're smart? Yeah, and so wouldn't you also say that this method of trying to find out what other universes is it like the method we used, Dirac used to predict antimatter, right? So you use the tools of mathematics, you try to make something consistent, out of it pops antimatter. Mm. You do it again, and you get the Higgs boson. You do it again, and out pops other universes. Isn't yeah, that? the only problem with that, that would be beautiful yeah. if I could go and do an experiment to see the multiverse yeah. the same way I see the Higgs or the positron, you know. But I can't. So it, That's where it's different. Yeah, so the mathematics is compelling, right? But being compelling doesn't mean it's right. And that's very important. Do you think that because 
in the past that compelling mathematics has turned out to be true, that physicists feel that it must be true about the multiverse? Well, you have to be careful. It has been true a few times, sometimes, not always. Okay. And of course, when it is true, it's so mind-boggling spectacular that you go, whoa, you know, there is something going on here, right? But you can't make that into a rule. 